ladies and gentlemen, we are almost sold out on one of the slowest days ever of this festival. Thank you so much. Holy Lord. Yeah, fuck yeah. Two whistlings and the entire front row just went, hmm. Uh, the entire front row is every type of white person you find at an arts festival. From guy who can hack into the mainframe to guy who's needlessly wearing hiking outfits while sitting down. He's wearing a gilet, but he's drinking. What wind is he breaking? And then you two who look like you have a hell of a fucking vision board and you, madam, have an Etsy store that would make my dick hard. <laughs> and thank you all for gathering here in this very off-putting room to stare at a man who is a comedian, but that doesn't look like one. Thank you for sh going, mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand this. I'm an off-putting person. I've had to deal with it my entire life. I get it. I'm 37. I don't look 37. I don't really look any age. I just look like I've been through a lot. <laughs> and brothers and sisters, I have. In the last calendar year, I got divorced. I nearly died in a bicycle accident. I got bed bugs. My best friend got diagnosed with a terminal illness. And I shit my pants. <laughs> Thank you for raising your eyebrows as if to say, you have been through a lot. And I'll have you know, it wasn't a self-inflicted wound, the shitting myself. I want you to know that. It wasn't like I, I was at a petrol station and a guy just had a bucket of seafood and was like, I'll give you the whole thing for a fiver. And I was like, well, a deal is a deal, my friend. It's very simple. I was uh, peeing in my toilet with my penis. <laughs> when I simply remembered, oh, I need to... I need to meet my brother. Oh my God, I'm late to meet my brother. We better pick up the pace. Now, as you know, sir, and you may not know this, the penis has a function where you can push internally and that will force the urine out of the body quicker. And I did that in this moment. I pushed and I'll never push again. Because when I pushed, I think my asshole went, I would like to go fast as well. So I ended up shitting my pants while looking at a toilet. Which, let me tell you for free, doesn't make you feel like you've won. I don't know if you've ever shit your pants while looking at a toilet, but I discovered in that moment that's the closest failure gets to success. I then quickly bagged everything made of cloth in that bathroom. I removed the clothes I was wearing and I threw them in the bin. Friends of mine, upon this discovery, were shocked. One friend said, you know, you could have just washed those clothes and worn them again, which is a very long way of saying, I've shit myself as well. <laughs> And it was in these clothes. <laughs> and by the way, the reason why I'm so draconian about the caca is that I live my life by a rule of ethics. And the first rule on that list is if something is covered in human shit, that is garbage now. <laughs> that doesn't extend to other bodily functions, brothers and sisters. If you are able to pee onto something, that something is yours now. <laughs> Which is how I came to own Edinburgh Waverley Station. <laughs> From the bridge, I'll have you know. And a woman named Heidi came to own me. Because <laughs> it's the last night I'll tell the story. I was sleeping with a woman named Heidi. She was on top, I was on the bottom. She looked at me, she said, I'm gonna try something. And uh, I sort of responded like, okay. And then she hovered over me, confidence on her face. And then the confidence totally evaporated. And then she just peed all over me and then lay next to me and said, that's not what I was trying to do. <laughs> Hell of a way to lose your virginity. Now I'm running and I'm thinking. I'm running towards my brother and I'm thinking. And what I'm thinking is, just don't tell him you shit your pants and then no one will know. Do you want to know how you get away with shitting your trousers, my friend? You just don't tell anyone, and then it's like the perfect crime if shitting yourself was illegal. I arrive at the cafe. There's my brother, stood there, patiently, quiet. He looks at me, I look at him, and he goes, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine. I shit myself. How are you? He's 19, I'm 37, and that's how he became the older brother. I know some of you are wondering, John, how how did you get a 19-year-old brother at 37? Is there a story there? Yes, there is. It's a very short one. Here's how it goes. I turned 18 years old. My dad looked at that situation and thought, hmm, let's try this again. <laughs> I heard some oohs and ahs in there. I feel bad for me. My father was very supportive throughout my life, very much helped me 
through my divorce. I am a divorced man, as I mentioned. It's interesting being a comedian and mentioning that I am divorced, because I've seen other comedians mention that they are divorced, and when they do, they get like, oh, are you okay? When I mention I'm divorced, I get this stunned silence as you're all sitting there thinking as one, we know you look very divorced. <laughs> I should take that as an insult. I don't. I take it as a compliment, because for the first time, my look and a fact about me have lined up. <laughs> For example, I am not a police officer that's been involved in a racially motivated shooting. <laughs> and yet some of you are not laughing because you're too busy going, that's where I recognize you from. <laughs> I'm not an athlete at all. Do you know how many people have been disappointed that I'm not an athlete? Do you know how many people have kicked a ball towards me only to get up, why, why would you do that? <laughs> not an athlete. I have something called dyspraxia, which means I was born without reflexes or hand-eye coordination. It is a disability, and it's a very rare disability. So rare, in fact, that when I said dyspraxia, most of you didn't think, ah, oh, he lacks reflexes or hand-eye coordination. No, most of you sat there thinking, ah, oh, he's mispronouncing dyslexia. <laughs> I can read fine. You throw a book at me, and then I'm fucked. <laughs> Do you know what it's like? having a disability that no one is aware of, I receive no assistance. Like, you know that fun ramp on the bus? They don't bring that out for me. I don't need it, but the option would be nice. Do I use the disabled toilet? Of course, but I use it like all of you, with shame and haste. <laughs> I had to tell every member of my family about my divorce. That took a long time. My family is massive. I don't know, like big, like too big. But my family is so big, I've arrived at family funerals to be greeted by the person I thought was dead. <laughs> oh, hello, Mike. What the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> and, and my family doesn't tell me anything, so it was a weird experience to be telling them something. Like, nothing. Like, for five years, my family walked in the MS walk, the walk for multiple sclerosis. On the sixth year, I couldn't make it. And I mentioned this at Sunday supper where the whole family was. And they all kind of were like, ah, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit ridiculous. And I finally just sort of said, hey, I don't want to be rude here, but we don't know anyone who has multiple sclerosis. Why are we walking in support of research for that? Shouldn't we be supporting a cause closer to our own hearts, like alcoholism or heart disease? We don't need to walk for MS. We just need to walk towards a vegan restaurant. <laughs> and then my aunt stood up and said, I have MS. I've had it for six years your dad was supposed to tell you. <laughs> and then my dad raised his head from his plate of food and went, John, your aunt has multiple sclerosis. She's had it for six years. I was supposed to tell you. I was very nervous to tell my dad I was getting divorced. Because here's the thing, I suffer from uh, like low level anxiety, not like the full blown anxiety, not the like, I can't leave the house. My anxiety is more like I leave every social situation thinking, ha, ah, fucked that up a bit. <laughs> Not enough to do something, but I will be thinking about it for the rest of my life. <laughs> and it was ridiculous to be nervous to tell my dad I'm getting divorced. My dad has been divorced three times. <laughs> now, if you've never met someone who's been divorced three times, just picture someone who had half their stuff taken away three times. <laughs> my dad's like a minimalist with baggage. <laughs> I, uh, I was so fucking nervous to tell my dad, so fucking nervous. Like when I called him on the phone, I didn't give him an opportunity to speak. The phone rang, he picked up. Before he could say anything, I just went, Dad, I'm getting divorced. Have you ever heard someone smile before? <laughs> and then his response was, holy shit, buddy. Well, guess what? Now you're gonna understand me, motherfucker. <laughs> and then he hung up the phone. <laughs> Which was a huge help in my divorce, because for the first time in days, I wasn't thinking, oh my God, I'm getting divorced, love is dead. All I was thinking was, did my dad just call me a motherfucker? <laughs> I, uh, I, I gotta tell you, I, I didn't enjoy the process of getting divorced. I did enjoy the amount of, uh, of, of stock I had to take in my life. I had to address things about me that were just always bothering me. Like I'm a sexually insecure, person, I'm very nervous when it comes to anything to do with intercourse, but like, <laughs> maybe it's because that's how I say it to the ladies. <laughs> hey, do you want to go have some intercourse? <laughs> Where am I from? Canada, and this is not my real voice. Um, yeah, you're right, the last day is a time to riff. Um, <laughs> we brought the cameras in, let's try out a new fun character. Who's that? Well, this is Sex Pest Johnny, and I don't know why I'm doing this. Um, <laughs> 
How was the Hastings' last show? I think he has schizophrenia. Uh, he doesn't. Sex pest Johnny certainly does. I really like the divided reaction towards sex pest Johnny. Some of you are laughing at one man finished his pint in two gulps. Uh, but it is a genuine problem. And I think it is based in some natural trauma that I occurred through my sexual life. For example, the first time I ever had sex, someone did pee on me. <laughs> or the first time I ever masturbated seconds after orgasm, my mom knocked on my bedroom door, sensing she shouldn't enter, and then said through the door, uh, John, your grandfather just died! <laughs> Thank you for the laughter, and fuck you for looking at me with eyes that say, yeah, you seem the type. Now, I also think I received no sex ed growing up. I think that's probably part of the problem. I received no sex ed whatsoever. I'm a Canadian man. In your heads, you're all thinking, well, Canada, that's a very liberal place. Why didn't they have sex ed? Well, it's because Canada's not actually that liberal. Canada is a deception the way uh, a hot tub is a deception. <laughs> From a distance, you see a hot tub, and you're like, holy fuck, that looks relaxing and clean. <laughs> And you get in the water and you're like, this water feels like gravy. <laughs> and then you're joined by the people who regularly inhabit the hot tub and they're all men with beards and if you had to describe their vibe, it would be homophobic, but they want to fuck my face. <laughs> That is Canada, in a nutshell, right there. So growing up in the 90s, they tried to abolish sex ed completely. Uh, the parents revolted, saying things like, we well, don't want to teach them about fucking, so you got to teach them about fucking. Not the exact quote. And, like, my mom didn't want to teach me about sex ed. The closest she came to giving me the talk was we were watching an episode of The Golden Girls together, and at the end of it, she just muted it and said, so any questions? <laughs> and I said, yes, why is Blanche such a slut? Eventually the parents and the teachers compromised, or the parents and the school board compromised, and uh, a gym teacher was given uh, papers, pens, and a box. So let me ask you a person, did you have sex ed at school where you grew up? Uh, I'm from Ireland, so no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you could have just said, I'm from Ireland, and we all would have done the math. <laughs> It's interesting how Ireland's fucking changing, you know what I mean? Ireland used to be the desolate economic wasteland of Europe, and now that's England. <laughs> Thank you for that whistle. <laughs> Take that, you English cunts. Now, well, Canada, much similar to you. Now, do you have any anxiety when it comes to sex and stuff like that? Or are you just, you're, well, you're friends with these two fucking stallions, so any question they can answer, or you can't find the clitoris, let me show you. You know what I'm saying? I luckily, I unfortunately do not have two fuck pals as business partners, so I unfortunately have had to walk that mucky path by myself. And it's been very difficult. I don't know if you guys know this, but if you enter into that realm with no information whatsoever, which I did, no information whatsoever. It's not like they got the biology teacher to sit us all down and explain situations. They literally got the gym teacher. You remember him, the PE teacher? You don't think, intelligence when you think of someone wearing shorts and going, run faster, you know what I'm saying? If you are a gym teacher in here, suck my fucking dick, you losers. The only reason you have your current job is because you did too much fucking wine and fucked out of being a professional football player. Why do you take that anger out on the fat kids? Was I one of those fat kids? Yes, I was, and I'm back for revenge now. <laughs> fucking guy provided no helpful information about my body or a woman's body in any way. I only remember two questions being asked and answered. Here was the first of the, so I don't know if I took you through it, but basically the compromise that was struck was uh, uh, the gym teacher was given papers, pens, and a box, and we could sit in the auditorium for one day for two hours, and any question in that box, he had to answer within that two hour arrangement. Spoiler alert, not the font of information advertised. <laughs> Here are some sample questions. Sir, can I give you a bukkake? <laughs> His response, no, and that's misspelled. <laughs> what a surprise, the gym teacher can spell. Now, the other question I do remember was a bit more serious was, uh, sir, I, uh, I had my period last week for the first time ever. I'm still feeling like my body is different. Is there something wrong with me? Now, this was the gym teacher's answer. Periods have nothing to do with sex. Don't bring them up again. <laughs> Which, if we're being very generous to this fuck, a bit inaccurate. He should have stood there and just spoken from the heart. Look, it's 1998 and I'm a straight white male gym teacher. 
a period to me is something that goes at the end of a sentence and I don't even know why it's there. <laughs> so I am sorry, but please ask a woman or someone that you know and they may be able to shed some information on what is happening to your body. And gentlemen, while we're on the topic, a woman's menstrual cycle is not disgusting. It is a beautiful celebration of the fact you are not a father for another 28 days. <laughs> I do not understand what government's thoughts are of robbing people of sex ed. It's not like that's gonna stop us from fucking, because sex is like food. If you don't teach me how to cook, that's not gonna stop me from eating. That just means what's for dinner is gonna be weird. <laughs> Have I fucked a watermelon? Of course. Now, in, uh, in uni, or university, I was lucky enough to have sex with two women over four years. Legend! And when I had sex with the first of those two women, the condom burst, possibly because of the might of my cum. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Very powerful. And uh, so it was either the might of my huge load of cum, or it was the fact that I was so anxious about a woman coming to my house that I may not get the condom on quickly, so I stretched it out on my feet before she arrived. <laughs> we will never know who the culprit was in that situation, but we will know that I spaffed huge inside of her. And then after she said, hey, we need to go get the morning after pill tomorrow. And I did not know what that was, but I didn't want her to think I'm a geek, so I just went, oh yeah, I've taken that pill a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, the next day we walked to a pharmacy, uh, we, got the, uh, we got the pills, and as we were about to leave, the pharmacist decided to moralize to me. He just leaned over his little weird stage thing and just went, uh, hey, are you aware of what's about to happen in that young woman's body, thanks to your irresponsibility? And then I said, no, my gym teacher never told me. <laughs> and I, uh, I was nervous today. I was so nervous today because it's just like, well, what if you get a girlfriend and that's just going to end? And like all of like it, it, then they do, you know what I mean? And some breakups are good, some breakups are bad. And, and I got on a dating app eventually and I, I met a nice lady and we went on a couple of dates and I ended up spending the night and uh, no one peed on me and no one died and, and the condom fucking held and, uh, and, and no one punched me in the face, which has never happened in a sexual scenario, but an ex-girlfriend uh, did do that to me. Uh, I'll take you through the story, and I know a lot of you are now on her side, and I want you to know that hurts. <laughs> now, it was my first ever uh, long-term girlfriend. We were living together at the time, and we were supposed to, we needed to break up, but we didn't know how to break up because we were very immature, because we were like 21 or 27 at the time. <laughs> Just those, like, you know those knockdown, drag out fights you have with that person where you're like, oh yeah, we thought we were soulmates, and I don't even fucking really, I don't know your middle name. And, and it, it just sort of was just like, we just wouldn't fucking commit to breaking up, and then finally, on New Year's Eve, after fight, after fight, after fight, I just stormed out and went to a house party that I didn't think she knew about, and so then she very angrily stayed home and started drinking and doing drugs. And then I went to this house party where I remained very sober. If very sober meant drunk and on drugs. <laughs> she arrived at the party after hunting me through the city like a bounty hunter. And then she arrived and the fight began again. Now I don't know if you've ever seen two people who are drunk and on drugs have an argument, but it's filled with understanding and compromise. <laughs> Just kidding, at one point I remember going, that's my point, bitch. <laughs> And soon after that, I was punched in the face. And we woke up the next morning. She was uh, to the uh, right of me. She rolled over the pillow and just went, hey, I think we need to talk about last night. Uh, I think we might need to break up. And then I said, you punched me in the face last night. I think we did break up. And uh, then we dated for three more months. <laughs> and I, I gotta tell you, leaving that woman's house that morning, it felt, felt like the clouds were lifted, not parting, but lifting. I'm sure you've all been through something in your life and you all know that moment. That moment where you're like, I don't, I think things are gonna be okay. And I was riding my bike. I ride a bike every day. It's how I get around. It's my meditation. I love it. I don't look good on a bike. Like you, my gilet wearing friend. You must look mwah on a bicycle. I see you on a bike headed towards Leith. I immediately just think, oh, he's off to teach blind kids about graphic design. <laughs> You see me on a bicycle and you just assume I got caught drinking and driving so many times. I now have to ride a bike. And I was riding the bike through uh, Los Angeles where I live. I am a uh, Canadian who lives in America. And if you're in this room right now uh, judging me uh, for living in America and you are Scottish, 
please fill your boots. Judge away. Have a lovely time. If you're uh, judging me and you're English, you can suck my dick. <laughs> your country is just as fucking bad. It's just evil in different ways. And the vibe down there, have you been? Have you been recently? I can tell these three bald men, you've been recently, especially you, my friend, with eyes that go, make fun of them, do it, I will. You take a train from Edinburgh, and by the time you hit that fucking border, it feels like you've taken, gone through a tunnel that's entered in my dad's head while he's driving, just needlessly angry and accidentally racist all the time. <laughs> And America, yeah, each day it's marching closer and closer to a neo-Christian fascist state. Can't argue with you. Here's what you need to remember. I live in Los Angeles, California. 360 days of sunlight. Do you know how fucking nice that weather is? It's so nice, you forget about fascism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here's what you do not understand about America. There is no evil in their hearts. I know it looks like they're filled with hate. It's not that. It's that they have not had an education system for 45 years. They're trying to help the earth. They don't know how, so this is what happens. I know you don't believe me, but think about it. They were told Saddam Hussein was bad. They went in, got rid of them, found some oil, and went, well, we love oil. That comes with us. <laughs> they took away a woman's right to decide what to do with her own body, and they didn't communicate why they did it. They didn't do it because they believe women are second-class citizens. They just want those kids to die, not in a woman's body, but in a school, or from climate change, <laughs> or from the opioid crisis. Do you understand? The, I can feel this fucking tension. And you go fuck yourselves. I'm fucking right and I'm, you're fucking wrong. The English, they're fucking evil. Have you fucking seen them? Have you fucking seen Jacob Reese Mogg with a double-breasted suit that conveys, oh, the last time you got a hard dick is when you closed a hospital. Do you understand? <laughs> But when you look at the Americans, they're just trying to fucking help. They're just too fucking stupid. The American flag should not be the stars and stripes. It should be a man stood in front of a nuclear bomb's mushroom cloud saying, I did not know it was going to do that. That's my favorite noise at the Edinburgh Festival, which is one person starts to applaud and everyone else goes, disagree. So I'm in LA that day. I'm going down a hill on my bicycle. So I'm going down that hill, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like things are gonna fucking get better. Birds are chirping and the sun is shining. Going down a hill, when I go down a hill on a bicycle, do I pretend my bicycle is a motorcycle? Of course. <laughs> do I make the noises with my mouth? <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm going down this hill, suddenly my handlebar snapped in two. Now, thank you. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced the absolute thrill ride that is your handlebar becoming handlebars. <laughs> but it is so jarring. I didn't think, oh, I'm gonna die. All I thought was, ah, should have worn a helmet today. <laughs> now there was a specific reason I wasn't wearing a helmet, brothers and sisters, and that is this giant, stupid fucking head of mine. This is an eight and a half sized hat. Why is it more tense now <laughs> than when I revealed my jizz killed my granddad? <laughs> And that fucking hurts, quite frankly. I'm very self-conscious about that. I've, all I've ever wanted is to be able to wear baseball caps. And it took until December of 2016 for them to make one in my size. It took America electing Donald Trump for someone in the garment industry to go, holy shit, we're gonna need bigger hats. <laughs> The helmet industry has not caught up to me, unfortunately. I, um, I, uh, I, I can't wear helmets. I used to just jam one on my head and go for it. And then I was told, I used to live behind a hospital in 2011, and I used to cycle through the uh, car park as a uh, shortcut. And as I was cycling through the car park, a doctor yelled at me, hey, I need to talk to you. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been catcalled by a medical <laughs> professional before, but you don't enter the conversation thinking, ooh, I bet I'm healthy. <laughs> I genuinely thought he was going to walk up to me and say, do you know you have cancer on your back that's visible to the naked eye? <laughs> and he walked up and he went, you see how that helmet is appointed on your head? If you make impact with almost anything, it is not going to protect your skull, it is going to smash your skull. And I just went, wait, so I shouldn't wear a helmet? And then he went, well, it's your body. And then he went back to his cigarette. <laughs> Let us find the silver lining in those handlebars breaking, brothers and sisters. The silver lining for me is in that moment when the handlebars broke, it was a mystery. I didn't know what was gonna happen next. 
I'm a 37-year-old man. I'm old enough to remember a time before smartphones, a time when information was something you had to seek out. It wasn't at your fingertips. And if you did not look up how something was caused or how something happens, you just didn't know. And it was a fun mystery. You could just encounter, oh, ooh, like fog. I never looked up how fog happened. So when I encountered fog, I, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Clouds on the ground? I am no bird. <laughs> Now you walk through fog and immediately think, oh gross, someone's vaping. <laughs> so, I quickly found out what was going to happen after the handlebar snapping, and it was a nice fun trip to the ground. I uh, should have had pain coursing through every aspect of my body. Uh, luckily, I was distracted from the pain by the bus. <laughs> now making its way down that very same hill. At such a rate of speed, I knew almost instantly, oh, now this is how I'm going to die. <laughs> now, I don't know if any of you have ever had a near-death experience, but I felt mine was a bit anticlimactic. I, I didn't experience any flashes of memory. I didn't relive any moments from my past. I would have loved to see a couple of memories. You know what I mean? Simple ones, like being 19 years old on a hike with my friend Chris. That's for me. <laughs> I agree, brave. <laughs> I, on a hike with my friend Chris, just in the Gatineau Hills, outside of our hometown of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, just winding up the trails to end up at a cliff's edge to watch the sunset. And as we're approaching the cliffside, Chris turned to me and said, hey, John, did you know I could suck my own dick? <laughs> and I remember saying to Chris as I was straddling the log, um, uh, I don't believe you, Chris. I don't think you can do that. <laughs> and then, my friends, he did it. <laughs> At the side of a cliff while the sun set. And let me tell you, when I see a sunset, sometimes I can still hear, Go. <laughs> did Chris grow up to be a police officer in my hometown? Yes, he did. And when I go home to visit my mom, is job one to borrow her car, drive around the areas he's known to patrol until I find him? Then I roll down the window and yell, Cocksucker! And then just drive away, because in that case, not homophobic. <laughs> As I am watching this fucking bus get closer and closer to my body, I just have to be honest with you, I felt like a failure. I felt like I should have known that handlebars could do that. I felt I should have just made sure that I was not in the path of a bus. I don't want my parents to end up at my funeral. And, and in this moment, it truly felt like that was going to happen. And then a stranger was just walking on the sidewalk, leaned out into the middle of the road and gave the gentlest of waves, just enough to get the bus driver's attention, who slammed on the brakes, and then the bus skidded to a halt, a foot from my prone, vulnerable body. And then this hero got on the bus, and the bus drove away. <laughs> I got a lot of injuries out of that little, what are you, a bus driver? <laughs> I got a lot of injuries out of, uh, out of that accident. I think the most long-lasting one is I have something called uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. And for those of you who don't know, uh, something triggers a memory of the accident, and then I relive every sensation of the accident, sometimes in real time. I've thrown up, I've super cried. I, I think it's really fucking jarring. And luckily I'm in therapy for it, and luckily my triggers are very rare things here in Scotland. They're just uh, people, wind, and traffic. <laughs> it's been a fun month! Uh, <laughs> And I've only had one attack since I got to the UK. I had one on the train on the way up here. I think it was because of stress. And as I was on the train, someone dropped a bag and the bag sounded like my body hitting the ground. And I just started to freak out. I started sweating and I started dry heaving. It was a very packed train and it was on a table uh, with like a fucking Scottish lump. You know what I'm talking about? Which is like fat, not from food, but hatred of the English. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> kind of guy like cut him square sausage and tweed would fall out, you know? If you had to guess based on visual appearance, you're like, this guy is right wing as fuck. You ask him any question and he's the most left wing person you've ever met. It's, like, it's actually called intersectional. Paul. And you're like, who the fuck taught you that word? <laughs> and he just leaped out of his chair with an agility I didn't think he possessed, put his hand on my shoulder and went, I got you, Paul! And then he went to the bar car, came back with a strongbow cider, <laughs> put it in front of me, motioned for me to drink. I didn't grab it immediately, so he took it back, opened it, necked it, put it back in front of me, went, Glasgow! <laughs> and then got off at Newcastle. 
<laughs> I'm in therapy for my PTSD. It's a somewhat confrontation therapy. Basically what it is is I take a skateboard to a skate park. I stand on the skateboard and I shimmy. And I shimmy on the skateboard. So air travels over my body. And then the people that are at the skate park, they trigger other memories of the accident while traffic is going around. And I quietly say to myself internally, don't worry, the accident isn't happening. You're just simulating it. These feelings are real. Do not freak out. It's OK. I love doing it. It makes me feel I'm back in control of my own body. I love it. Let me tell you who does not love it. That is everyone else at that skate park <laughs> looking at me not like a man having therapeutic breakthroughs, but a man who is definitely working for some sort of drug informant agency <laughs> who's put no thought into his disguise. <laughs> Reading skateboard chums would just love some drugs, by the way. Anyone, anyone have any narcotics I could sample? <laughs> and I enjoy being back at them after so many years. I stopped hanging out with them at sort of 14, 15. Now I'm back at 37. And I enjoy seeing how they've changed, yet remained the same in that intervening time. I like seeing that sort of stuff as I get older. Graffiti is a great example of this. It's really changed, but really stayed the same. You know, graffiti, it's always been a warning. Just the warning has changed as it's gone through its, you know, life cycle. Like, I remember when graffiti first came out, and it was a warning. You'd see it and be like, oh my god, watch out! There's a gang here doing art, I think. <laughs> and then now you see graffiti, and it's still a warning, but it's a different warning. It's like, watch out! This craft ale, it's going to be very expensive. <laughs> One day I'm on the skate park, skateboard in the skate park. I'm shimmying. I don't know if you guys know this, but skate parks are very cliquey, territorial places. I was in LA where I lived, and I skated too close to some California bros. You know what I mean? A Kyle or a Trevor. <laughs> This look, and, and one of them got in my face and just went, Hey man, I've been watching you a couple of times since you come to the skate park. Why are you on the skate park, skateboard, bro? You're not doing any tricks. You're not even pumping. What the fuck? Now, this young man does not realize he just asked me about my accident, and when you do that, you're getting the whole story. So I went, oh, I'm on the skateboard because I was in a catastrophic bike accident with my handlebar snapped. I landed very hard on the pavement, was almost hit by a bus. My humerus bone uh, was cracked down the middle. It was a straight break, uh, not a jagged break. Why that's important is because if it's a straight break, the bone will not knit together properly. And because that bone is internally vascularized, which means there's a vein running into the bone, if the bone is not knit together properly, I will be susceptible for something called bone death, which means my left arm would have had to be amputated. Luckily, there was surgery. Eight screws were screwed into this bone. And then I waited two weeks to find out that the surgery took. Have you ever spent two weeks thinking, oh, you better clap, because this might be your last opportunity? <laughs> Let me tell you, those boys were not prepared for honesty that day, friends. Because their response to that was, oh, I thought it was because you were gay. <laughs> and then his friend hit him on the arm and went, hey, he could still be gay. <laughs> How progressive of you. I got given Oxycontin for that injury. For those of you who don't know what Oxycontin is, it is a pharmaceutical grade heroin pill developed by a pharmaceutical company and then overprescribed to the American population, like extremely over. For like 10 years, they were giving people heroin for broken noses, sprained ankles. One person got it because of diarrhea. Another person was prescribed it for over 10 years. It was prescribed to a child as young as 11. As a result of this overprescription of this drug to the American population, now five percent of the United States is addicted to heroin. Can you believe that? Five percent. It's unbelievable, right? Yeah, it is unbelievable. I've totally fucking made it up. You guys need to be nicer to America, especially if you're English. They're your only friend left, motherfuckers. And understand the math in that. Five percent of Americans, do you know how many Americans there are? 350 million. That's almost 19 million people. If there were 19 million junkies in America, even they would have to do something because you couldn't do anything else because people would be too busy asking you to borrow money. It's not 5%, it's 4%. <laughs> I always feel nervous about that joke because I feel like people don't think that I, like, I, I it's not that I, I don't mind heroin addicts, quite frankly. I find them pretty peaceful as addicts you encounter in society. Like, drunks can fuck off. Like, hey, where's Terry? I don't, fuck you. That's die. Like, but a heroin addict, they're just 
Hey, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, 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 Four percent of the American population, I see them all the time. The 15 million people who are addicted to heroin in the country I live in, you encounter them. Like I was at the LA train station, and I, I remember I, was in the, I went to the bathroom to use the, uh, the urinal, and as I walked in, there was a guy shooting up in between the urinals, and I was just like, whoa, because I'm not expecting it. And he was just like, hey man, the stalls were full, and when you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> We ended up chatting in that bathroom for 25 minutes. He then walked me to my train platform, at which point I discovered he was a vegan, uh, to which I said, well, I guess beggars can be choosers. <laughs> he did not laugh like you guys laugh. And then my train arrived. I went to shake his hand, because we'd been talking for 45 minutes, and he went, whoa, COVID, and then just walked away. <laughs> I can't be addicted to heroin. I'm not that COVID conscious. And so I just spent two weeks in bed waiting for this arm to heal. The first five days I was on Oxycontin. Fifth day I stopped taking it. And I stopped taking it as soon as I could because this pill was, ooh. <laughs> like on the first day, uh, I watched TV for 13 hours and that TV was not on. <laughs> And I remember on the fifth day I came off it, they said it would trigger a suicide-like depression. They were totally accurate. Uh, my left side was completely immobilized with bandages and a cast, just hoping that my arm would heal. In my right hand, I was holding, I'll never forget this, my terms of separation papers that had been couriered to me that day. And I was just looking at my bed, trying to figure out how the fuck do I get back in there in the least amount of pain. And then three bed bugs just walked across the duvet. And I, 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 the only positive spin I could put on it was at one point I remember thinking, well, it'll be nice not to sleep alone, I guess. <laughs> and I thought that was the lowest I was gonna go. And then a month later, my best friend called me and told me he had been diagnosed with something that was gonna end his life more than likely in a few months. And it was the heaviest moment of my life. I, I, I just remember as a comedian, I remember thinking, I gotta say something to make this guy laugh. So I just said, uh, well, it's nice to hear that I'm not having the worst year. And then he said, no, you are. I haven't shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, then, uh, I then got to watch uh, my friend die. I, I spent the next three months speaking with someone who's slowly succumbing to something. And it was, it was brutal. Uh, he passed in February. I remember getting the call. I had just arrived in San Francisco. Um, his brother called me and explained he'd fallen into a coma. There was no way he was coming out of that coma. Uh, and his brother explained that the next day uh, they would be unplugging the machines and nature would take his course. And I remember, it's weird what your mind clings to in those moments, but I remember going like, why are we waiting until tomorrow? And he said, I asked that question as well. Uh, the guy that does this has already gone home for the day. <laughs> I've thought a lot about that guy. I think in terms of uh, consequences of a mistake, that man may have the easiest job in the world. What happens when he fucks up at work? Roy, bad day? Yeah, it was a bad day. Three people lived. <laughs> and I just remember getting into an Uber that day. The Uber driver said to me, sorry, the back seat's a bit messy. And I just remember being like, I don't give a fuck about your back seat, man. And I just had bigger things and I started to cry. And I'm not a good crier. If I had to compliment this entire front row, you all look like you cry exceptionally well. You miss especially. It feels like it's like one single tear. Everything that's ever bad has ever happened to you comes out in a sentence, glass of wine, you fuck off. I am not blessed that way. You see me crying and you don't think, oh, he needs help. You think, I need help. <laughs> and in the back of that, ooh, I just fucking lost my mind. That's not the good cry of the grief period. The best cry of the grief period happened in a grocery store about a month later. Uh, fun fact, everyone, do not cry in a grocery store. Far more echoey than you realize. <laughs> and the staff will not leave you alone. They will come up with questions like, what are we out of? <laughs> So I was by the bananas just having a fucking weep. And, and I like the bananas. It's a place of truth. It's the only food in the grocery store that we all actually know how to identify when it's ripe. <laughs> how do you know when beef's ready? No fucking idea. It uh, looks red, that's good. You know what I mean? But a banana, you know, you look at it and you go, ah, it's green, that's ready to go. And you take it home and you put it on top of the fridge and it goes from green to yellow to brown and you put it in the bin. <laughs> And that day I was just, ah! 
by the bananas. And I felt this tap on my shoulder and I turned around and there was just this stranger stood there and he went, my friend, you look like you could use a laugh. And I said, I could. And then he picked up a banana and he said, I am from Guatemala and this banana is from Guatemala. And then he peeled it, ate it, and left without paying. <laughs> pausing only at the door to turn back to me and say, I am not from Guatemala. <laughs> I uh, remember being in that Uber in San Francisco. It took us 45 minutes to get from the airport to my hotel. We pulled in to the hotel car park. The Uber driver turned the car completely off. He undid his seatbelt and he turned completely around to me and he just said, I just want you to know I have never seen anyone deal with a messy backseat worse than you. <laughs> I, uh, I, I miss my friend every day. I was lucky enough to deliver his eulogy. I, um, I was not originally scheduled to deliver the eulogy. I was originally scheduled to be a pallbearer, uh, which as someone with uh, no reflexes, hand-eye coordination, <laughs> and one good arm, that's my fucking Everest right there. <laughs> And uh, that was switched. I ended up delivering the eulogy. Five minutes before the funeral was supposed to occur, my best friend brother marched up to me, panic in his eyes. I don't know if you've ever seen someone panic at a funeral before, but your mind goes to dark places. Like, what, we lose the body? I got a plan, all right. <laughs> we'll kill someone else, replace him, you know? I, I just remember being in that stillness of a funeral. I always find that, 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 that sort of 20 minutes before a funeral starts very awkward. You know what I mean? People having conversations, they don't know what to discuss. I remember one person, at one point walked up to me and said, uh, oh, it must be so hard for you. You're alone in America, and we have all our friends here. And I remember being like, I'm not alone. I got bed bugs. I got lots of friends. <laughs> and, and I'm talking to my friend's brother, and he just walked up with this panic in his eyes. He put both hands on my shoulders, and he just went, John, I, um, I was supposed to tell Larry he was delivering the eulogy. I forgot to tell Larry he was delivering the eulogy. So I was wondering if you can deliver the eulogy in about five minutes. I immediately said, yes, brothers and sisters, but I have to be totally honest with you. I did not feel up to it, but I had to, because if he, I didn't do it, then who would have delivered a eulogy? I don't know if you've ever been to a funeral when no eulogy is given, but you don't walk out with hope for the future. You walk out thinking your friend's a cunt. It's, that fucking deserve fucking more. <laughs> it's the last fucking day, and you're fucking treating me very fucking nicely, but I'm at the end of my fucking rope. You're all doing this. Make the noise come out. Fifteen more minutes of fucking quality con Don't fucking cross your arms. <laughs> I'm not that guy, totally. Feel free, it's your body. Do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. But uh, you say cunt and people got scared in Scotland? You're gonna be in trouble tonight, friends. <laughs> Trying to order a pizza. Which one do you want, you cunt? How dare you! <laughs> what happened to that person? I don't know. They were a cunt because I said cunt. <laughs> I don't know why I died on that hill. It's just been a long month. <laughs> and we're just trying to get this on the fucking wax, and then you go, ha, and too much. <laughs> and I've fucking dealt with fucking pressure before. I delivered a fucking eulogy with five minutes fucking notice. Back into the show. Now. <laughs> Because you got to fucking have a eulogy at a funeral. you got to. you got to. I have no love for the Protestant segment of fucking Christianity, but they have figured out how to do a funeral. 45 minutes, one person gets up, says three nice things, then everyone gets drunk. It's perfect. <laughs> Even if you're a dog fucker, someone's getting up there and going, look, Roy loves dogs. <laughs> so with five minutes left to go, I found a quiet corner in the reflecting garden, started writing out my speech. And then I was joined by another comedian. Now the reason why there were a lot of comedians there was my friend was an Edinburgh director. He spent his life making people funnier. He was very nervous about the funeral. A lot of selfish people. I don't know if you've ever met comedians. We're selfish. Look at how this art form is presented. No light on you, only a light on me. <laughs> if you don't laugh the way I want you to laugh, I will bring it up. <laughs> Surprise, that was a callback all along. <laughs> Thank you, for comedians, for enjoying the structure. The rest of you, that portion wasn't for you. And I just wanted to escape that selfishness that day, and I wasn't able to. I was joined by a comedian, 
49 to 51, I would guess his age. You know, that sort of Generation X hypocrite kind of person where you can't call him on his bullshit, but you know, he says he's liberal, but if you're gay, he's bringing it up. <laughs> like a hypocrite, you know what I mean? Like he, said, like he says things like, I wanna know it's absolutely fucking mind bending that when I go like this, you laugh louder. <laughs> Indicating to me, oh, we thought it was funny. We're just fucking with you. <laughs> Come to the Edinburgh Festival. The audiences will pack into your room to be silent. <laughs> Why are they doing that? They want you to earn the laugh. <laughs> when will they laugh? Oh, you'll never know. <laughs> hypocrite. He's a fucking hypocrite. You know what I mean? Like the hypocrite. Like he says things like, I'd never teach my kids about Santa Claus. I don't want them growing up in a fantasy world. And all you're thinking is, you met your wife playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> your life is a fucking fantasy world. And I fucking just sit there just scribbling. I just wrote Paul, that was my friend's name. That's all I got. And then he walked over and he started telling me with no, I didn't go like, hey man, can you tell me a story of a bad speech? He just walked over mid anecdote, telling me the story of a bad speech he saw at a wedding, not a funeral. A wedding where the bride's father got up and told the following speech about the bride's ducks when she was seven. They were named Daffy and Dolly. And evidently when the bride was seven, she went for a walk to find her two pet ducks and she encountered them fucking at the side of a riverbank. Yeah. Dolly fucking Daffy, what a surprise. And evidently she didn't know what was happening because she was seven and unfamiliar with the truly violent and intense uh, 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 lovemaking that ducks are known for. Google it, it is truly a, what the fuck, you know what I mean? You walk away, I didn't know ducks were German, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and she didn't know it was sex, she just thought one duck was attacking the other duck. This was traumatizing to her, but she was seven, so to comfort with the trauma, she wrote a song that she would sing before bed because she was afraid of having nightmares of the ducks attacking, that she would relive. A song that was then sung to me by the comedian <laughs> and my, Yeah, who's gonna fucking find out? <laughs> And my best friend's fucking funeral. Was the casket being loaded into the funeral hall as he was going, feathers? Yes. And then he leaned forward to me and said, so what would you have done if your daughter saw two ducks fuck? And I was so bewildered by the question. I almost said, I don't know, man. My gym teacher never told me. <laughs> I walked in and I, uh, I fucking knew this would get me. I, uh, I walked in and I spoke from the heart about my friend. I, uh, I talked about the man that he was. I didn't talk about his work. I, uh, this is the last time I'm gonna say this. I talked about how he was a person that walked this earth just, just wanting to make sure everyone was included. If you were at a party, with new people that you barely knew and he was there, he would absolutely make sure you were included. He just wanted you to change his mind and he wanted you to change your mind. The world is less curious and less interesting now that he no longer walks among us. I miss him every day and I really liked doing this show because I got to talk about him and I'm gonna miss it. And I'm so happy I got to spend this month in this room, telling jokes to people that would laugh most of the time <laughs> that he and I worked on together. And I never get to do that again. And it was a, it was a fucking good eulogy. There was a lot of fucking shit stacked up against me, but I fucking got through. And I will always be proud that I was able to give my friend a good fucking send off. And that's what it was. It was a good send off. It wasn't a great eulogy. I've seen great eulogies. <laughs> my Aunt Ida eulogizing my Uncle Norman after 67 years of marriage. Uh, I am a divorced man. I don't want you to think I'm cynical about love, but 67 years is too long. <laughs> if that marriage was a person, they would qualify for a pension. <laughs> Pension, there's Gen Z's in here. Uh, a pension is something <laughs> you will never experience. 
And she got up and she spoke from the heart. She talked about how he was the beginning and she was the end of the same sentence. She talked about how um, she just wanted five more minutes with him. Not to say goodbye or I love you, just five more minutes. And then she revealed that Uncle Norman had cheated on her almost every year of their relationship. <laughs> yeah, it was tense just like that in the church that day. And uh, then she started naming names. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty fucking awesome. I was at the back with my dad and my brother. My brother was nine at the time. And then Ida leaned over the lectern, pointed in the second row, and just went, Ah, Heather, didn't think you'd show, you slut. <laughs> at that point, my brother turned to my dad and went, Dad, does this happen at all funerals? <laughs> my dad turned to my brother and just went, Yes. <laughs> I can feel some of you not enjoying that joke because you're like, well, he just lied to a kid. Yes, he did. But he taught me a very valuable lesson, which is you want to know how you get through dark shit? You just find the fucking joy in it. There's something fucking happening. You might be getting your terminal cancer diagnosis, but guess what? That doctor was holding in a fart. Ask some questions. <laughs> You wanna know why everyone's walking around society with our fucking shoulders up all angry? It's because for two years we fucking sacrificed so much just so that other people we didn't know didn't die of a <coughs> disease. And now we're out back in society walking around going, I sacrificed for this? <laughs> why? We need to talk about the positives of the last two years. The Tiger King! <laughs> why aren't we talking about the... Do you understand we all got locked inside and Netflix went, Hey, do you want to hear the story of a gay meth head tiger owner? <laughs> who runs for president and then it gets weird? <laughs> I, I, I genuinely think that that's the way forward. And you guys, that's why you're here tonight. You know what I mean? That's why you fucking came in this fucking Neil Gaiman decided fucking venue. <laughs> and as you leave, you're gonna put some joy in my fucking bucket. That's right, I know the amount of you that bought a tickets and there's a lot more of you than them. <laughs> So I will see you after. Bring money. <laughs> and I will not leave you on a plea for money. That, that is gauche and disgusting. Uh, I will leave you on, uh, on the story of the night I, I realized I was getting divorced. Very much illustrative of the thesis I just presented to you. That's right, used thesis. That's why I got four stars. Now, <laughs> my marriage, we didn't, it didn't end because someone was a prick or someone cheated. It ended because we changed fundamentally as people and what we wanted from life fundamentally changed. And our relationship didn't adjust to this change fast enough and it broke. And we didn't realize that. So we just spent six weeks fighting with each other because we still loved each other but didn't know why things were suddenly different. I don't know if you've ever fought with someone all day, every day, for six weeks. But by the end of it, my first thought every morning was, and another thing. <laughs> At night she would sleep, I could never sleep, I would just wander LA where I lived, just thinking about the fight we'd had that day, thinking about what the fight would be tomorrow. And I remember being stood at a crosswalk, and I just realized, my essence is defined by this one thing, and I need that to be who I am, and I like being who I am. And my wife's essence is defined by this one thing, and she needs that to be who she is. If that's taken away, she can't be who she is, and if mine's taken away, I can't be who I am, and that's not fair, and our marriage, is structured in a way where one of us is gonna lose this, that can't happen, and then I realized my marriage was over. And I think my legs were so worried about this decision that carried me away from where I was thinking about it, but unfortunately it carried me into the middle of the road. So I'm now coming to grips with the fact that I'm getting divorced while cars are literally whizzing by my fucking butt. Finally a white car just gets like right here to my legs and just leans heavy on the horn. And I don't know if any of you have ever been divorced, bald man, second row, just guessing, definitely. <laughs> For those of you in the back, he just went, of course. And in that moment, you feel so wrong. You feel like you could have made a different decision that would have changed the course of your entire relationship and you wouldn't be where you are in that moment. And that is how I felt in that fucking second. And then when he leaned on the horn, I just couldn't be wrong anymore. So I just went, oh, shut the fuck up with that fucking horn, you fucking car boy. Take that! And when I gave him the finger, I suddenly realized, that's not any car! That's an LAPD cop cruiser! <laughs> oh good, I'm going to jail. 
and getting a divorce. Which is not something I want to experience, but is a country song I would listen to. <laughs> I, uh, I knew I needed to say something. I saw the car door open, I saw the cop's shoes hit the pavement. Just thinking like, oh, you can't go to jail. Because if I go to jail, I have to join a gang. And like, my heart is with the Latin Kings, but... <laughs> with this complexion, it's Aryan Brotherhood or nothing. And I saw him rise above the doorframe, and as soon as I saw his eyes, I just went, Officer, I am so sorry. Are you married, sir? And then he said, I am. I understand. Goodbye. And then he got in his car. Thank you, gentlemen, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.